ladies and gentlemen, another day, another record that Magnus Carlsen has broken. And today, I'm very excited to announce that Magnus Carlsen now has the highest ever Blitz ELO achieved on chess.com, crossing and surpassing Hikaru's recent 3336 with a record 3,300. And 40. Yesterday, Magnus logged on to chess.com and decided he had had enough of not being at the top of the leaderboard. And good lord, my friends, when I tell you, uh, this man absolutely crushed several opponents in a row. I am not exaggerating. I'm going to share a few of these games with you. Uh, and he did it apparently on his phone. And then he took a photo with someone's dog. I think Magnus is currently in the U.S. Recently, he celebrated his birthday uh, at, at, I think it was in Miami. I don't know. He's having a you, you go, look. Miami is like the best city in America to go to for three days or five days. I like. I, I don't think there's a better place on earth that's like great for three to five days, and then is probably the worst place of all time. Uh, anyway, beautiful dog. Uh, I, I was gonna say beautiful man, but you know what? I, Self-explanatory. Uh, and um, his chest is beautiful, and also speaks for itself. And in today's video, I am going to show you his games from yesterday's run. Also, I have COVID. <laughs> uh, I have COVID. Uh, yesterday, I recorded a video where I said my throat hurt, and then after that video, I decided to test just because I had to fly, you know? I'm a responsible man, uh, and a beautiful one, by the way. Uh, and, um, and it turns out I, I, I have COVID. It's very mild this time around, and COVID's this weird thing now where, like, Half the population tell me of COVID, they're like, it's just a cold, go get on a plane. It's like, look, you know, I'm gonna do the responsible, I'm gonna stay home till I test negative. Uh, and um, I'm still gonna try to get to Toronto, but the fan event won't happen on December 7th, it's gonna be rescheduled, email should have gone out uh, to January 26th, I hope. And if you can't make it that day, then we will refund you. And I'm gonna try to be in Toronto for the Champions Chess Tour Finals, which begins on December 9th. Uh, and I got energy. I mean, I'm just positive, but, you know, I'm also positive because I tested for good vibes. That was horrible. Magnus plays D4. I'm going to take you up the rating ladder from 3313 to 3340. In this game, he's playing the second best Norwegian chess player in the world, Ari Antari. Knight F6, and Magnus plays G4. I just realized game review is going to give us feedback, which I find very funny. Uh, it's gonna give us these the, these annotations, which is which is quite hilarious. Um, yeah, this is a gambit. This is called the Gibbons Weidenhagen gambit, and basically Magnus is just giving away his G pawn to take the entire center like this. It's a terrible opening, but not when he plays it. When I play it, I <clears throat> you know I just I just lose all my games. Uh, the idea is very simple. You give away a flank pawn, a side pawn to take control of the center, win Tempe against your opponent, uh, and then you want to maybe even use the G-file to attack. The best move here is definitely for Black to move the D-pawn, fighting back for space in the center and defending the knight on G4. Um, but uh, Aryan goes back, Magnus attacks him again, and again, and again. I mean, he just pushes him all the way. I don't know why game review is on, by the way. I hope it's not on for the rest of these. Uh, for some reason here, it's gonna give us these annotations. Uh, and, and Magnus basically just develops as fast as possible, right? Like, again, the computer is, is just being a mega hater, but, uh, well, it is what it is. Aryan captures the knight, takes. Magnus has a very big center. He's going to play knight f3. He's going to put his rook on g1. He's going to play bishop g5, targeting the queen and maybe trading off that bishop, which will soften up that g7 pawn uh, for the rook when it... <coughs> oh, my goodness. When it gets to the open file. That's basically my only symptom. It's like my throat a little bit and a slight cough. And I guess I have to talk for 30 minutes on camera. Uh, so I'm going to be coughing a little bit. I do apologize. But I feel much better. Like I had COVID last year. It was very bad. I had fever. I felt dead. Uh, now I just feel dead inside. But that's because I'm a chess player. Night of, I got COVID for my birthday. I mean, like, seriously. Anyway, Magnus is two pawns down and makes a rook move. Which is just like gangster behavior. Rook g1. The idea of rook g1 is that if Aryan takes another pawn, Magnus is going to go here, and if this trade happens, he's going to be able to take on g7, which is the entire idea. Uh, Aryan clearly doesn't like that, so he doesn't take the pawn. 
Magnus still goes bishop g5. So he's played this double pawn, Gibbons Weide Weidenhagen Gambit. Aryan playing queen d7 and then trying to fight with his knight. But the second that Aryan takes his knight off the center, Magnus takes this way. <clears throat> and the idea is that there is now a very nasty threat. And the threat is rook d1. And uh, the threat is hitting the queen and then mate. So, sensing that, <clears throat> you know, Aryan has to do something. He takes on c4. And Magnus obviously has to... T no, he doesn't. <laughs> he hits him with rook d1 anyway. The queen is hanging. It can't move because that's mate, which is brutal. And so, Aryan, he can move the knight back and cover. Instead, he sacrifices the queen, which apparently is a mistake. Magnus centralizes, forcing his opponent to make a rook move. So now he can't castle that way. Not that he was maybe planning it anyway. He shoves Aryan's bishop back. Then he plays knight b3 looking to reroute. At some point, he tries to trade off Aryan's bishop so he can soften up that. Notice the time advantage as well. And he just puts his king on c1. King is completely safe. Aryan has 12 seconds. Bishop takes. Knight c5. And when this knight gets in, boink. This is hanging. That's hanging. And the game ends in a very brutal way. Aryan runs away with his bishop, but his king perishes and is brutally checkmated in the center of the board by white's pieces. King has nowhere to go. Knight and queen swarm. What a game. Uh, I love when Magnus plays offbeat gambits. Like, it's so much fun watching him play these, like, ridiculous openings. And by the way, this is really not that bad of a gambit. I mean, it is, it is aggressive. It is bold. Uh... But uh, not all the games that Magnus played to get to 33-40 were, were that crazy. Uh, this game against Nihal Saran was one of the most impressive positional games I've ever seen in my life. And I say that a lot when he plays. So first Magnus played d4 knight c6, which is like super provocative because obviously white can go here. And attack black's knight and then black will get, you know, booted around the center. Um... But Nihal is a, a London player, so he plays the London. So how does Magnus Carlsen defeat an opening that is as annoying as the London? He plays an imbalanced way, put, put, puts the bishop on g4, and then he develops his pieces in a way that, 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 that's pretty confrontational. And now Magnus does something which is very funny. Like, we're teaching all of our, you know, students, like, put a knight in the set castle. No, he just plays h5. Dude just straight up plays h5. Plays h5 because if you play h3... This could happen in the future, which is really, really bad uh, for white. Now, Nihal allows Magnus to push on that side of the board and then kicks him out with his own h3 and now basically says, look, Magnus, <clears throat> this pawn's going to be a liability. It's not going to be an asset. And I'm going to play c4. I'm, I'm playing in a, in a style of Queen's Gambit, right? c4, solid position. I've made no, no mistakes. I have an advantage. Stockfish claims I have an advantage. Magnus says, yeah, yeah, I know, but the only way I'm going to beat a player of Nihal's caliber is creating a little bit of a tactical situation, a little bit of a confrontational situation, all right? Like a little bit of a, of a fight, of a struggle, you know? But by pushing your H-pawn all the way, really? Like, okay, fine. Puts the bishop on E4. Notice how Nihal is playing very fast, by the way. Nihal is not intimidated by Magnus. He is one of the world's fastest players and accurate. Magnus puts the bishop on d5. And when this knight left the pressure, Magnus now castles. Despite having that pawn all the way advanced on h4. And the computer agrees with him. Somehow, he just understands that this pawn can't really be targeted. <clears throat> For example, knight f3, you just take, play d5. And actually, you're going to see that that kind of happens. Bishop f3, and instead of taking the bishop, allowing the knight to get there, Magnus takes this knight. And then he puts his pawn on d5 to have a strong center. And then he just starts focusing on the queen side. He's like, all right, Nihal, you want to trade queens? Let's go. I have a liability over here. But I think I'm strong enough to beat you in a position that's completely symmetrical. Neither side has a c pawn. White has a bishop for a knight. Imbalance, which is supposed to be slightly better. Bishop 2e2, and the idea is very simple. Knight f3, and I want to win your pawn. I just want to go knight f3, and at which point this pawn is going to fall. Magnus plays g5. And the idea of g5 is to meet knight f3 with knight h7 or knight e4. 
And you're gonna see that this encroachment on the white position is not just a defensive necessity for the black position, it's actually designed in an aggressive way. Now, Magnus zips out to, to d7. He could play here. <clears throat> also, his king could go to g7, right? There it is, slow improvement. It's a very boring position. No C pawns. The rooks are staring at each other. Nobody wants to take the other person's rook because if you take the other guy's rook, his rook is gonna control the whole file. Now Magnus plays f5, oh my. Clamping on that and the king is gonna go join the pawns. This is what you need in an endgame. If you can take space without creating weaknesses, it's a good thing. You should push pawns and chess as long as you're not creating weaknesses. This is a weakness, but it's not attackable, <clears throat> which is important. If the knight could attack that pawn or the bishop could attack, that would be a problem. There's no way. Nihal starts attacking Magnus. Magnus backs up, strikes at him with his flank pawn. We have a trade, and now this is the best move Magnus plays all game, and it is a high-level move. Knight D, B8. Returning, I don't remember which knight that was, but it goes to a home square, reinforcing the knight, trying to get out and there. That is now a threat, so he has to be defended. Magnus now looks to take over the file by doubling the rooks. We have a trade. We have equal material, symmetrical pawns, B, D, E, F, G, H, two rooks and a knight. How is Magnus going to win this game? It's 0-0-0 against one of the best Blitz players in the world, Nihal Sarin. Activate the rook. Control the file. Control the file. Now, there's a golden rule in chess. If you want to win an endgame that you are trying to win, particularly with rooks, you trade one pair of rooks. If you are trying to draw, you trade both. And I'm saying that because the best move here for white was king d1. I'm not saying I would have played king d1. And I'm not saying Magnus would have traded both rooks. He probably would have gone here. But that's the point. You try to trade all the rooks. Because knight versus knight probably can't win. But let me tell you who can win. One rook and one knight. And the reason for that is defending with a rook is very challenging against an offensive rook. And watch this. Suddenly that pawn formation is an asset. Knight c6. That pawn is a weakness. I'm zipping, I'm, I'm, I'm zigging and I'm zagging, right? I'm going to g1, knight b3, and Nihal's entire position falls apart. And that pawn is a hero. b7, by the way, if you're confused what happened there, he didn't take because there would have been this. But g takes h3, the pawn's just going. Now he takes, he takes because of b7, rook g8, knight d7, here you do make your queen, but... Uh... And the crazy thing is, that pawn that Magnus advanced in the opening, h5 and h4, literally won him the game. It won him the game because Nihal reacted, and they played the entire endgame on completely symmetrical position, but all Magnus had is a space advantage. And it is so crazy to me, he turned this into a win. He turned this into a winning idea. This is a 3100 rated Blitz player. Like, you and I could live three lifetimes, combine all of our chess ability, we'd, we wouldn't be near that level. Crazy. Also, I don't know why Nihal always changes, like he's playing under the Tanzania flag. I, I, he always, Chile. Um, anyway, what a game. Um, I got two more for you. Uh, and uh, this one was against Wonderful Time. Wonderful Time is Tuan Min Le. For a long time, he was the world's strongest IM. He was crazy good at Blitz, is crazy good at Blitz. I drew him recently, which was a big accomplishment for me in Title Tuesday. Magnus at this point, 33-25. Uh, and we will end the, the day with him playing Daniel Naroditsky. Um, Daniel Naroditsky probably was awake at like 2 in the morning when Magnus was playing these games. He was like, yo, I got to get some games against Magnus. And Magnus was on fire. <clears throat> Wonderful time. Tuan Minle was actually streaming these games as well. They played a, a long match. Actually, Minle did quite well. He had some good positions against Magnus. Uh, E4, E5. And Magnus plays a gambit. He plays the Danish gambit. Uh, the Goring Gambit is technically knight f3, knight c6, d4. Technically, this is the Goring Gambit with knight f3, knight c6. But d4. And now not queen takes, but this. And rather than playing takes <clears throat> and accepting the Danish Gambit, Minlay plays this move. And the theory here is that white takes, has an isolated pawn, develops, and black plants the queen on c4. Those of you that are advanced players who actually study the theory of some of these gambits, uh, like, you know, at 900... At 900, life is good. You know, your opponent, uh, you play this, your opponent takes, you go here, your opponent takes, and your opponent, like, hangs a queen. Like, that's life, you know, at triple digits. Uh, but you have to study your theory at 900. So, cd4, knight c6, 
White does this. It looks like Black is able to win this pawn by taking, but you can't do that because I would remove your oxygen tank. I would take your knight with check, and then I would take your queen for free. So rather than that, Black goes here, and then takes and plays queen c4. And this has all been played before. The idea is to prevent White from castling. That's basically the point, and now Black wants to castle, put pressure on White's center. All been played before. What does Magnus do? What he does best? It sends an invitation to, to, to Millet, like, let's go to the endgame. Queen b3. Millet says, yes, I would like to go to the endgame, but I want to do it my way. Now, you'll notice Millet spent 30 seconds on that move. More. 27 plus 17, more than 30 seconds. That was a, that was, that was terrible calculation by me. Uh, I have COVID. I have COVID brain. Uh, 44 seconds, right? Um, now, this is theory, at which point, you know, White has the doubled pawns, but the active rook, and then both sides castle. But Magnus uh, does this and just very cleanly just snags a pawn, just takes the b7 pawn, uh, gives his opponent a check, and now does not guard the pawn here, but rather gets out of the way. Because the pawn on b2 is not that significant. Because then I'll go here and I'll immediately counterattack. So Minlay accidentally kind of falls into a little bit of an opening trap and basically has to trade off some pieces, and we have the following position. Magnus has bishop for a knight, and an extra pawn, and a little bit of imbalance to work with, and he just makes it look so simple, all right? How do, like, how do you win this with white? You probably plant your bishop somewhere it's solid, defended, and sniping the enemy position. Then you advance your pawns. You gotta double up your rook, and remember the rule of thumb. If you're gonna trade rooks, you can trade one. I would not trade both, but when you have bishop endgame up upon, probably you're going to win. All right, but last game, it was not as clear. So he gets his bishop kicked out. Here comes Minlay creating counterplay. Right now, some of you would be tempted to defend your pawn here. Let's say rook c1. But then black is going to get active. Black is going to start bothering you. Play knight d2, for example, rook a6. And you got to be very careful. Magnus here understands that this is not a major problem. Plays rook f5. The point is that if knight c3, which is completely free, by the way, suddenly there's that. Let's say you play f6, rook c5, which is brutal, because then I get in and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat everybody over there. So Minlay has to defend his king. Now Magnus goes here. He immediately warps the rook around to attack the pawn that is the softest in the black position, forcing black to play this ugly but necessary defensive move. That rook is toast. And now, and only now... He advances his weakness. He's going to go here. That move has two purposes. Deflect the rook from the defense of the pawn, but second, fix the pawn on the same color square as the bishop. White wants a world in which he can exploit the pawns on the same color square as his bishop, like that, by the way, by the way, but also he wants a world in which at least one rook survives to target the other pawns on the dark squares. So the rook is going to target pawns on both colors. The bishop is going to target pawns on light squares. And the pawns are going to work in a way where they create a barrier pushing back the opponent's pieces and not letting them get comfortable on any squares. And then, since it's an endgame that doesn't have queens, the king is going to play a, a prominent role. With queens, a king really shouldn't play a prominent role in the endgame because he's going to get smacked around because the queen is a beast. All right? Knight d2, and by the way, what a move. Targeting that bishop that's a little bit stuck in the mud. Gangster move here from Magnus. The threat from black is to grab the bishop and get in. My dude says, you want to take my bishop? King f2, bozo. King f2. Now if you want my bishop, you activate my rook. This leads to rook a7 and the collapse of your position. Right? <clears throat> we get into a rook endgame. I have this, and they are mobile. That is a mobile set of pawns. Now Minlay does it his own way. He does it like this. Knight b3. At this point, Minlay is busted up. He doesn't trade rooks. He keeps the rook active, but it's just a matter of time. Magnus is rapidly approaching the position. First, he goes here and plays defense, but again, he's also up like 50 seconds on the clock, so he could technically do anything. If this was titled Tuesday, and they had a second of bonus time, he actually has to win the game. He can't just, like, stall f5, but look how clinical this is. That pawn is the last pawn remaining, rook c7, but there's another major problem here for black. I wonder if you understand what it is. That pawn's weak. But what is the other major problem for black in this endgame? It's the king. When your king is not just uh, not active, when your king is actively exploitable, it's a problem. Rook a1. Of course Magnus finds it. Abandoning his pawn because I'm going to get into the back rank. It's not mate. 
but I'm going to trade your rook, remove the defense of this pawn, and it looks like I can't get in at all right now, but let me tell you, when that pawn goes away, I suddenly have two connected pass pawns. Two connected pass pawns, three, four squares away from queening is fatal. And when the dust settles, Magnus is only a pawn up, but let me tell you, this feels a lot more than, like, like a lot more than one pawn. Now it really feels like a lot more than one pawn. He pushes, you can't let the king get close. If king e8, you don't give a check. You don't give a check. You can give a check as long as you come back, but you just play rook c7. And the idea is you go for these pawns, right? Let's say black plays g6. You, you, you can even snag another pawn. But you have to set this up in a way where you slowly bring everybody forward, grab as much as you can, and then push. Push in a methodical way. King f7, rook c7. Now you can push. Why can you push? <clears throat> because you will play c6. Here, ensure the queen promotes. Or, black does this, and you promote with discover check, and you win the game. And so Magnus got to 33-30. Clean game. And this one against Danya was sick. This was the game that clinched him the highest blitz elo 33-40 of all time. I think the game previous, he had broken the record, or he had tied it. Maybe he was 33-36 or 33-37. But ending it on a good note. Highest ever rating. Petting a dog while, while he's at it. E4 from Daniel Naritsky. Daniel, in my opinion, in 3-0 blitz, particularly online, blitz with no increment, no bonus time, I think Daniel Naritsky on a good day is the third best. I want, I want, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Three minute, no bonus time. Especially online with a mouse. The three best players in the world are Magnus, Hikaru, and Daniel Naroditsky on a good day. That third place spot could be up for debate. It could be for Ruja. It could be Nihal Sarin, who I just showed you. But these guys are monsters in 3 0. You start adding bonus time like 3 1, 3 2. It's no longer Danya because he loses a little bit of that element of like time because he's an aggressive player. He's an initiative player. But if you let his opponents have a lifeline not to lose on time, that's a big lifeline. But he's, in my opinion, on a good day, top three in the world in 3-0 in chess, which is crazy, which is like a crazy accomplishment. So very cool to see him playing bishop b5. It's a close Sicilian with bishop to b5 check. It's called the canal attack or the Mos I thought this was called the Moscow variation, but I don't know. Uh, and basically white brings the bishop back because he already forced black to make certain commitments. Magnus plays e6 and then starts taking a little bit of space on the queen side. He's going to play bishop e7, bishop b7, and then he's going to castle. Or he's not going to do any of that. He's going to play c4, which is interesting. So I don't know why he would play c4 and not finish up his development first, but that's why I talk about the games and he plays them. He does this right away. Now it's a matter of which of these pawn breaks is white going to use, right? Close position, eight pawns each, pawn break to make progress. He does it this way. Magnus is not going to take. He wants to keep his pawns together, but to enable that, he needs to make sure this rook is protected because every time a pawn moves, mentally, you have to think what's happening in the position, what's opening. Bishop b7. Now two things defend the rook. We have a big trade. Danya develops the knight, targeting that weak pawn, and Magnus hit. <coughs> what? Why did Magnus not play like that or that or something? I, I guess he didn't like knight d4. Which is crazy. This dude just straight up gives away a pawn for nothing. Now, I don't think this was exactly planned. But I think his level of understanding here is so high. Again, this could be just gas. Like, I could be gassing him up. It could have been 2 a.m. in Miami. Magnus was in his underwear, like on the toilet, and he just hung the pawn on B5, and he just overestim uh, underestimated White's position. But actually, in the fallout, it's really, the position's really interesting because despite being down a full pawn, like a pawn that just got taken, and, you know, a move later, he just gets out of the position like nothing happened. Despite that happening, somehow this pawn controls such important squares in the white position which if white doesn't fight back for those squares with d3 or b3 he's never going to develop a, the, the dark squared bishop he's going to have to move his d or b pawn and it's actually not that easy to do so knight b5 for example castles you may ask why not this well because actually who's going to guard that like that's that pawn is going to be taken 
take, take, take. You know, queen e2, I'm gonna go d5. Like, black's chilling. And then black is gonna spend the rest of the game fighting against these two. So, knight a3, and now Magnus plays d5. He, he's the one, he's the one calling the shots. He's like, not so fast. D, even d5 is a weird move to me because I thought the whole idea was to pressure this. He says, no, let's trade. Naradinsky's happy to make that trade. Bishop d5. And Naradinsky gets everything he wants. He gets everything that you would think he wants in the position. He gets to trade off his weak e4 pawn, which was under fire, the c4 pawn, which was a thorn. He's a pawn up, clean pawn. How is black better? How, how is that possible? Well, he's better because how is white actually going to use... Like, are these two pawns that are just standing around? Are they assets or are they liabilities? Right? It's like white has two precious jewels, but black has an avalanche, has two steamrollers just going straight at them. So are they assets or are they liabilities? Like, I just want to draw your attention to something. If white got several moves in a row, okay, and got a position that looked like this, right? And then, you know, let's say rook c8, and then black played like knight c, white played knight c4, and then white played like bishop d2, and then like rook b1. Now white is winning. Look at the evaluation, right? Now white is pressuring. Now, in a perfect world, what would happen is that, you know, white would get these pawns like this, but that, it's not a perfect world. It's not a perfect world. So how are you going to ensure that happens? Well, Danya starts pushing. The second he pushes, boom. And now that's weak. Magnus trades bishops. Why does he trade? Because Naraditsky lost the pawn. So instead of b4, the computer wanted white to undevelop his knight and defend. That's not, that's so hard. I mean, and then Magnus would have gone here and then he would have put his queen on a1 just for good measure. I mean, like, look how disrespectful the move queen a1 is. It's not the best move, but it's, and he grabs this. Naradinsky's pawn has fallen. He no longer has an advantage. Let me tell you, this pawn's not feeling so good without its friend. All right? Quit. Look at that move. The shish kebab right here. We got the, the red pepper, the green pepper. We got the Adana kebab on there. Bishop chief. Oh, where's that move coming from? Queen poking at the pawn. Knight c5 immediately taking advantage of the weakened square. And Magnus won the pawn. He won the pawn. Knight a7, though, is a fork. Slight blunder. Should have been patient. Should have played rook a8 first. Knight d4. Both guys miss it. We're going to forgive him for that. Queen a4. Knight e4 hits the queen. Bishop takes. Queen e4. And now, boink. A clean fork. White could play something like rook e2. But I got news for you. I could maybe even take this. Take. Take. Back rank checkmate. But that's not how the game ends. The game ends queen b1. Magnus grabs the knight. Not only does he grab the knight, he grabs 3340, the highest blitz elo in chess.com history. Uh, doing it by winning like 90% of his games in crazy, like interesting, sacrificing a pawn for a positional grind. That game against Nihal Sarn, one of the most impressive, symmetrical type of positions I've ever seen him win. That game against Wonderful Time, pawn up, surgical technique. The crazy game against Tari earlier. It's just fun. It's just, it's just fun to watch. And he did it all while apparently on an iPhone, just like hanging out in a friend's house, unless he has a place in Florida too, but um, very fun. I mean, it's just, it's just cool to see. And um, I'm going to go rest my throat. Um, <coughs> you all have a great rest of your December 6th or whenever you're watching this video. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Get out of here.